Please stand now for the reading of the written word. Beloved, let us hear then the written word from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 10, 14, and 15. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples as you are this day. Psalm thirty-three, twelve. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, and who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. From the New Testament, John three sixteen through 19. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. Romans six twenty three, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. First Corinthians 23 and 24, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Gentiles, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest. So far, God's written word. We pray, O Lord, that by your Spirit you would help us to understand your revelation as we are prone to have a very man-centered and arrogant view. We ask now that we would be humbled by the truth and give glory to your name as we see and understand even more fully how it is your love that is our only hope, and how in Christ Jesus your justice was satisfied. And now in love you are able to call to yourself a people and make them your own precious possession. And so we pray to know, understand, believe, be comforted by, and rejoice in your gospel this day. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It is one of the most unfortunate things that we are easily distracted And we are often caught up in the times in which we live. And we are unable to separate ourselves from that and to think clearly. And that's why almost every organization, every relationship, will often set days or events in order to kind of reorient ourselves and to be reminded of what's more important so that we will not be distracted And so one of the things we must do, especially as we regard the Lord Jesus Christ and the church, is to remember and understand who is God and what is it that God has done. Because our normal tendency following really kind of the spirit of the age is to think of God as a generic power and a power that seems to be, you know, somewhat involved with us, but manipulatable. And so we're not interested in a personal God who actually thinks and speaks and wills and acts and desires to do good. But rather we think of him kind of like wind and sun. So if we are able to use it correctly, you are able to move a ship, you are able to grow plants. But really, you don't have to think of him personally. You can offend him and not care. And this has come into the Christian church. And so many people will speak of God and Jesus and love. But when they're asked, like, why do you think that you are reconciled to God if you're a sinner? 
Well, their answer will be because I have done, and then they will list whatever it is that they've done. Starting from simply, well, I've prayed the sinner's prayer, or I've tried to do good, but ultimately they'll add other works to it. As though God was just neutral, sitting back, waiting for us to impress him. And people act like they've impressed him sufficiently that he now owes them every sort of blessing. What happened was, unfortunately, this corruption entered the church from the beginning, and throughout, God has, by his Spirit, had the gospel rightly announced in the scriptures and then preached, but there's always been a battle that has taken place. And so from early on in the church, the gospel was always being suppressed. And at the same time, God kept on raising up ministers and people whose hearts were called and they desired to know the truth, so they fought back. And so this battle between the what's called the Pauline theology, well, it's actually God's theology, it later became Augustinian versus Pelagian, the predestination versus free will. And this battle finally came to a head in the Reformation. And what happened then was the reformers went back and said, enough, let's stop just doing what we've been doing. Let's actually go back to the word. And let's look at what the fathers said as they studied the word. How did they apply the scriptures from the very first centuries of the Christian church? And what is it that God would have us to do today? And in the Reformation, we went back and we saw what God had actually said. He is a personal God, a loving God who has been horribly offended by our fathers. And yet, instead of judging and abandoning them, he graciously gave life to many, which is what we just sang in Psalm 106. And so what we need to do now is understand these things. And at the time of the Reformation, of course, it was opposed by Rome, but it was also opposed by people within the Reformed churches. And Unfortunately, this name that has come up is Arminius. He was a professor of theology, and he corrupted the truth that was in the confessions. So in response to God's gospel of grace being corrupted, in response to the blasphemy whereby man elevated himself and made God to be obliged to bless, the Reformed church fathers came together and said, let's define very clearly what we see God reveals about himself, so that God will receive the glory, so that man will know rightly how he is reconciled to God. And so the Canons of Dort is the summary of a five-month synod that was held, whereby the Reformed believers sent their delegates, and they struggled with Scripture and sought to understand what does God want us to know about himself. Now, you will be told by many people that Calvinism, Reformed theology, is wrong. That it is insulting to God because it makes God the author of sin. It makes us robots. Well, neither is true. Reformed theology, shorthand Calvinism, basically seeks to understand what God has actually said. It is Think of it more like detective work or scientific research where you are looking to see what is and you're not imposing a view on yourself. So Reformed theologians and ministers are not artists painting what they want. They are investigators seeking to understand what is there and then systematizing it so it can be understood. And what is it that we discover? We discover that God is a gracious and loving God. And so the canons of Dort are actually, these five heads of doctrine and various articles, are some of the most beautiful words that are put together to explain theology because it allows us to see the mind and heart of God and the grace by which he saves sinners. And so do not let people lie to you and tell you that this is divisive, unnecessarily detailed and pedantic, that it is blasphemous in any way. Rather, understand it is revealing a gracious God who gives to us life through his son, Jesus Christ. So, these are what are, uh, many of you might know as the five points, uh, the doctrine of tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. 
However, that is not the way that it is structured here. Rather, it begins by explaining God's gracious work to sinners. But it starts with Article 1. And you can see there the title. The, the titles are not part of the official um, uh, document, but they've been put in there to make it easier to understand. So it begins with the word since. As we begin to explain God and the mission of the church, we begin by first announcing who are the people who need to hear this. And it is all. Since all people have sinned in Adam and have come under the sentence of the curse of and eternal death, God would have done no one an injustice if it had been his will to leave the entire human race in sin and under the curse, and to condemn them on account of their sin. As the apostle says, the whole world is liable to the condemnation of God, Romans 3.19. All have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God, 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, 6.23. So the church father said, look, let's deal with reality. We're not coming to a good people, but rather God is coming to a sinful and rebellious people. And we need to understand a just God would have been completely vindicated if he had done nothing for man, but left man simply in his sin to ultimately be condemned. And that's very important. Because unless we know ourselves, we will not understand our needs. And so we see all have sinned. There is no one who does good. And God would have been perfectly within his rights to leave people to their own destruction. However, by the very second paragraph, but this is how God showed his love. He sent his only begotten son into the world so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So though they're all, all men are naturally condemned, God is a God who shows love and a costly love, sending his only begotten son. And we know what that means. He had to take on flesh to die for sins. And what would it take for people to benefit from this? to actually believe that this was the solution God had provided, to believe in Jesus Christ and to trust that he would be our righteousness and be condemned and die in our place. And how will this word go forth? Article 3. In order that people may be brought to faith, God mercifully sends proclaimers of this very joyful message to the people he wishes and at the times he wishes. By this ministry, people are called to repentance and faith in Christ crucified. For how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without someone preaching? And how shall they preach unless they have been sent? This is very important paragraph because it puts it on God to be gracious. Now, this is where many people are bothered. And the reason is that most people tend to think of everyone being equal, fair, that's good, because that's what we just said in Article 1, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But here is the error that the world makes, and many of us have also made ourselves. We act like God owes us, that God is obliged to at least give us an opportunity to change. Even though Article 1 makes clear God would have not been in any way unjust if he had let every one of us to be condemned. And even though we acknowledge that God is being gracious, in other words, he is doing something that he is in no way obliged to do, and yet we still act like, but he owes everyone. So the idea that God would only send his word to some people, at the times he desired, we find that to be unfair and we condemn God for it. How is this often done? Well, one is instead of taking the opportunity God gives us to support missions and to witness to others ourselves, we basically tell God that, well, if people didn't hear about Jesus, then they should be saved automatically because they didn't get a chance to reject him. But remember, it's not the rejection of Jesus that was the problem. It's that people were already condemned. And so God is free to choose to save some and to let others go by. 
But we won't give him that right because we don't like him being God. Instead, we want him obliged to do our will. But we need to see that God mercifully sends proclaimers of this joyful message to the people he wishes to send them to and at the times he wishes to send them. And it is only through this preached word that people are called to repentance at God's bidding. How do people respond when they hear the gospel? Article 4. God's anger remains on those who do not believe this gospel. But those who do receive it and embrace Jesus the Savior with true and living faith, they are delivered through him from God's anger from, and from destruction and receive the gift of eternal life. Now this one we're kind of comfortable with. Almost everybody is. Those who reject the gospel deserve to be condemned. But understand the wording here. It's not that they arrived neutral, and when they were given the option, they did not believe, and so they are rejected, but rather, they were already under condemnation. And that's why I said, God's anger remains on them if they do not believe, but God's anger is removed from those who do believe. So, who believes, who disbelieves? And that's where Article 5 comes in. The cause or blame for this unbelief, as well as for all other sins, is not at all in God, but in man. And that's the thing that people don't want to hear. God holds us accountable. So when we say that we are robots, no, we're not, because God is saying that you can receive blame for your action and for your unbelief for all sins. However, the faith which saves, the faith which believes and embraces Jesus Christ, and the salvation that we obtain by this faith is a free gift of God. So we are entirely responsible for our sin and condemnation, but God alone is gracious and saves sinners and gives to them a living faith. Because he even says, as scripture says, it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Likewise, it has been freely given you to believe in Christ. Ephesians 2.8 and Philippians 1.29. So, as I said, the Reformed Fathers wanted to know and understand the mind of God. They did not come to the scriptures and say, here is what we want. And we are going to come with our decisions and conclusions, and then we're going to pick out scriptures that support them. Rather, we're going to come as investigators. We are going to study what God has said, and then we're going to summarize it. And now the Roman church, the Arminians, many are coming and telling them, the Reformed, and saying, hey, we know that people sin, of course. However, God is not actually angry with sinners as sinners per se, but rather he's giving everybody a chance to be saved and the people who are saved are the ones who have understood and believed. And so they're trying to excuse God. They're trying to take blame away from God that some people are condemned. The reformers looked at this and said, God says he chooses to save some. And so you can see from the scriptures, from the Old Testament, God speaks through Moses and he says, The Lord your God is Lord, ruler of heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. And the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples. Telling the Israelites, you obtain the benefits of, because God, who is sovereign and free, chose to love you and not others. Psalm 33. The nation is blessed whose God is Yahweh, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Not the ones who sought out God, but the ones whom God made to be his own. And then Isaiah 52. The good news of happiness comes from the one who is sent by God. And it is not a people coming to God and saying, we're ready to work with you. In the New Testament, John reveals the mind of Christ. He says, God in this way loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. So that those who exercise faith, those who believe in him, should not perish but have eternal life. 
Now he goes on to say something very interesting, verse 17. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. What does he mean? According to the Arminian and Roman system, Jesus comes and offers you a choice. So you were kind of neutral. Now when you reject Jesus, you are condemned. So Jesus actually then becomes the instrument of condemnation in the Roman Catholic and Arminian system. And John says, no, Jesus was not sent to condemn the world. Rather, those who do not believe are already condemned. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment. The light came into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So the world was in condemnation, in darkness, doing evil, hating God. And God was right to leave us, but he didn't. He was gracious and sent his son to rescue some. And that's the point that John is making. So even this most famous verse that people think contradicts Reformed theology actually is just part and parcel of the theology that God reveals to us. Jesus tells his disciples, John 15, you didn't choose me. You did not in your wisdom seek out a way of redemption, but rather I chose you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit so that your fruit would abide. And I gave to you that when you prayed in my name, the Father would give you what you asked for. Romans 6.23, where we saw the first half, the wages of sin is death. And we saw in Article 5, the free gift of God is eternal life. Is this something that's easy to believe? No. 1 Corinthians 1.23, Paul speaks of preaching Christ, which to the Jews is a stumbling block. They have their self-righteousness. It's foolishness to the Gentiles who cannot imagine a just and holy God. But to those who are called, whether Jews or Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And naturally, we don't know this. We were all dead in our trespasses and sin. By nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God graciously chose to save. So, Understand then what is called TULIP, the five points of Calvinism, Reformed theology. They are all attempts by man to summarize the teachings of the gospel and to put the glory where it belongs, on God, and the guilt and responsibility where it belongs, on man. None of our sin is the fault of God. None of the blame goes on God. All of our unbelief, all of our sins, all of our rebellion is because we as moral agents are in rebellion against God. And he would be just to leave us in our condemnation. But God is gracious and freely gives life to the dead. And so as we continue on through the canons of Dort, we're not going to simply be doing theology for the sake of theology nor is it our desire to, you know, be better than others because we're more intellectually rigorous. It's to know who is this God and how to rightly worship him. That's our concern, giving glory to God. Now, just as an aside so that you understand how scripture works, we've spoken of this before, but just to clarify, many people will say, look, it doesn't work this way. Either you have God is sovereign, predestines, and therefore we are robots, everything is predetermined, or if we are in fact moral agents, then God is not sovereign, God does not predestine, rather God gives choices and you act on them. And that's human reasoning. However, throughout the scriptures, all so-called believers already deal with this tension of one God in three persons. We speak of the Trinity, which also is unreasonable by human standards because it speaks of there being only one God and no others. And yet it speaks of this one God with three distinct persons, Father, Son, Spirit, in communication with one another, forsaking one another when Christ is forsaken on the cross. 
So when they say, well, it's unreasonable to have a God who predestines, but a man who is morally responsible, well, the same, by the same reason, they should reject the Trinity because it is unreasonable to have one God and yet three distinct persons. Or what about the doctrine of the incarnation? We know God is infinite, eternal, cannot be contained. He is all-knowing, all-powerful. We know man is a creature born in time, having limited knowledge and limited power. And yet in the person of Jesus Christ, we speak of God and man united. The infinite, all-powerful, almighty with the frail, limited flesh that will die. Christian theology requires that we believe in the union of the two natures in the person, Jesus Christ. And yet again, how can a mere man have the fullness of God? How can Jesus actually be a man standing in our place, ignorant of the times and the will of the Father, and yet also be eternal God, able to bear the wrath of God and die on the cross? Well, humanly speaking, it doesn't work. We believe it because God has revealed it in the scriptures. We understand that apart from the union of the two natures, there could not be an adequate substitute for our sins. So we accept and believe it because God spoke. So when it comes to the doctrine of predestination and people tell you it's unreasonable or it makes God a monster or it makes us robots, simply remember are you a Christian? Then you believe what God has said. And rather than accusing God of being wrong or calling him a monster, rather you humbly accept that as a creature, you are limited in your understanding. And just like you receive the doctrine of the Trinity and the dual nature of Christ, you also accept and believe the doctrine of predestination and the moral agency of man. God is not a monster you're not a robot. God is a gracious God who does not author sin or tempt anyone to sin. And yet he is sovereign in every way. You are dead in your sins. You hate God. And yet God graciously gives you a new spirit and life. And in all this, you are a moral agent and not a robot. So as we go through the canons of Dort, it is simply laying out for us what we discover in Scripture. And I hope as we continue on with this that we would be even more grateful to such a loving God for his grace to us in Jesus Christ, especially when we come to the doctrine of the atonement and we see the bloody sacrifice for us by the only begotten Son of God. Let's pray.